All right, recording begins, and I am your host, Greg Gaub, Worldwide Stock Car Chat number 41, I think. Uh, yeah, so we're still doing it. Lots of regulars here today. We got, uh, I don't know which way it's going to show on YouTube, but we got Love Linkert, Wayne Lander, Garth Frud, John Kitt, Russ Faber, Dennis Sampson, Mike Maurer, Lloyd, RK, Leo, Phil, and many more in the non-video IDing people list. Uh, so as normal, I will begin with show and tell. I have a couple of pictures that I want to kind of show and tell, but does anybody else have anything they want to show and tell about first? Russ, go ahead. I don't have to go first, but... Go ahead. I Are you got another one? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, tell that, me what I'm looking at. The skill oh. Is that is, a drive wheel? This no, is a fifth wheel, a drive a, wheel? This is a 1956 Scale X, which is the company that was the precursor to scale electric. And this, you push the front end down, which raises these tires, and you pull the car back. And as you pull it back, it winds up the. It, yeah, it's spring loaded. I mean, you only have to pull it back a little bit, but pull it's it amazing. <laughs> it's, fr it's front wheel drive. Yeah? Yes. Yep. And what's amazing is Does it have a guide? No. no. It's not a slot car. It's a pullback car. Not a slot car. It's just a pullback with the car. box. Wow. Wow. You got the box. Oh, you got man. the box. Where did oh, yeah. you find that thing? And Where did the person who sold it find it? <laughs> well, that's just it. They put it on eBay. What? The eBay auction. And I bet on it, and I was able to buy it now, forty-five bucks. Wow! No kidding. Oh, wow. No, it's Should original. Oh. And then I went back on to look for another one, five hundred and eighteen dollars. <laughs> yeah. So I, I scored, but box. but what was unique is the box yeah. has your pit guys. Right. Yeah. And my understanding is people used to cut them out yeah. and use them as diorama. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was meant. That was what it was meant for. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that makes the bar. So it's still more. sealed at this end. Wow. <laughs> well, all I can say is you just got our hobbies equivalent of GameSpot. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that neat? I mean, to me it is. I mean, some people, it's a Ferrari 4.5 liter, one thirty second scale, but... Well, yeah, they were like 130th, I think. They're a little bigger. Yeah, 130th. How does it go down the driveway? Yeah, how's it, how's it go? <laughs> does it go down the driveway? <laughs> well, yeah. Like how come the tires aren't cracked? You, you push the front end down. Let's see if I've got anything here. It's amazing that it still works. Yeah. yeah. Push your front end down. Yeah, and then pull it back. Okay. You got to put a guide pin in when there. You push it down, you pull it back. Don't you just love kids who weren't allowed to play with their toys? <laughs> oh, yeah. Or it was a gift they, that never got given. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Wow. So that um, is something. Keyless clockwork is the drive in it. Uh -huh. So um, anyhow, I thought it was really neat. And yeah, that is cool. Price, I didn't think I could beat it. Right, you lucked out <laughs> on that feel one. Very cool, as a matter of oh, fact. It's not, the fifth what's feel is the key. Yeah. What's amazing it, is that is almost identical to the other two cars that Dennis worked on for me. Yeah, but and that the reason for that is that 
when Scalex, when Scalex got into slot car racing and they electrified them, right? They electrified the Ferrari and the Maserati, the tin plate cars that they already had. So that car that you've got there is just the precursor to the first Scalextric cars. And so they went from Scalex as the models to Scalex Trick with the TRIC on the end to denote that it was electric powered. And they used the same cars. So that's why oh, all the parts. Yeah, the well, that way they didn't have to retool, right? No. So, yes, those two cars that I restored or helped restore for you, those are exactly that. They're the Maserati versions, and that one's a Ferrari. Is anyone going to ask why is it blue? Uh, why is it blue? Yeah, Ferrari should be red, right? Uh, they, <laughs> they, they have. They released uh, but, but there, there was ah, I know why because there was a thin wall special Ferrari that was blue, or a very a very odd color of British racing green. Well, I've seen this in blue, yeah. and like I've seen it. it. I went back to look this to look it up, and if you go to uh, Worth Point, which is a huge auctioneer. Um, they've got some on there. In fact, I seen one that was the one for 518 bucks. Right. Yeah, but so, Wayne was wondering about a real, the real Ferrari and why it would be blue or, or like a dark green. But that's that's one of the reasons. Yeah, they yeah. actually did. They, they did get raced in that in those colors. Not yet. Very, very cool, Russ. Thanks for sharing. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? Um, I've got a photo or two. Go ahead. Some of you guys may have seen this already, but um, oh, damn, no, let's let's not show that. Uh, no, hang on, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Do you see that? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Black uh, F1 car. Yeah, that's the, the that's a better photograph. That's the new um, polycar generic oh. modern Formula One car with, with some work on it with the uh, oh. Atalaya decal set that comes from Spain and if you can see past the halo I have one of those Interlagos miniatures uh, hand painted Lewis Hamilton helmets on it and um, the guys are doing an absolutely spectacular. There, you can see the helmet a little better. the The helm, the the decals that those guys make uh, at, at the layer are absolutely spectacular because they fit. They 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 size to fit the particular, you know, to to fit this model. They're not just generics, so they make them out to fit this model. And they have. They have the the, uh, the Mercedes from last year. They have the Racing Point, uh, the pink ones. They have Red Bull. They have Alfa Romeo. They have Haas. Um, they have, I think they even they have Williams. I think the only one they don't have is the Alfa Tori from last year. And if you want, you should be able to zoom in on that with your mouse wheel. Just just scroll it. There you go. And then you can drag around. Oh, nice. Yep. And now these these helmets are are, are hand painted by a guy in um, in Brazil who calls himself Interlagos Minutias, and they are they are just spectacular because they're all beautifully detailed and then have a, a wonderfully deep and uh, very well applied clear coat over the top. Uh, you know they're like twelve bucks each, but. Uh, they they just they set off a model just so perfectly. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's what I got for you guys today. Be cool. All right, I'll go ahead and show what I got. I got something. I'll get to you right after me, Graham. Okay, thanks. Here. And so I wanted to show off this 3D print. If you hadn't already seen it, we've got bundle oh, up yes. standards. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, he's, he's actually got mittens on, hasn't he? Uh, got mittens. Uh, yeah. The mittens have texture too. Uh -huh. you kind of see it there. Uh, I, uh, it. I hate to say this, Greg, but if it's at a racetrack, you got the wrong Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't get that. 
Eccles stayed. Eccles stuck. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, and then let's see. Let me stop that one here. So I wanted to. We'll talk more about this. Uh, I guess it's still Chrome. Uh, but you guys should be seeing this car on this track. The guy was showing off the car, and of course, it's a beautiful car. But does anybody see anything odd about the track? Yeah. So what I see that's odd is the guy's tires aren't touching the track at all. Well, that's the car, but I meant the track. What do you see, Wayne? The braids raised. The braid braids raised. raised. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, uh, are you kidding me. And I and you can see damage to the braids right there in that picture. Oh, I'm yeah, like, but, yeah. why in the world would they do that? And so I complimented the guy's car and asked, what's up with the track? And he said, that's a, this is a Japanese commercial track. That's how all the tracks in Japan are built. Wow. I'm like, what the f <laughs> And And being a commercial track, it probably takes a lot of, a lot of hammering. And so yeah. the, the braids are un, uneven as a result of that. But I would have expected the braids to have been, to have been sunken for that reason, well, well below the recess, well below yeah. the surface, yeah. yeah. Maybe they maybe they run a spec and there's always a ground clearance and this is how they police it. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, but the risk of short circuit well, is much higher. That that's all. That's almost rail racing. The, the, my only thought was that they were taking that, that that they were like, how do we build a slot car track out of wood? And then they saw you know some how tos. But then they were comparing it to like Minco or something where the where the rails are raised. And they're like, well, that must be how it's supposed to be. So they did that for their braided track and that's just how it became. But they're gonna have to replace the braid every couple of years if they're very busy. That's, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, but maybe and, the braid in the car lasts a long time then, Greg. No one, no, no problem. Yeah, but it'll tear up the tires. They're going to be replacing their tires. Tear up the tires. Somebody yeah. said the braid will wear. Well, if it's magnetic more. braid, it probably helps. Yeah. Interesting to see that that guy has clearly paid attention to setting that car up yeah. by getting a, a front wheel height. And he's got it so high that the inside wheel is a good millimeter off the track. Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't really help a hard bodied car that much. Well, <laughs> you're going to be it. not. And if it had braids that were track height, then it may not be elevated, you know, and touch yeah, the track it, at it, that Yeah, on, on a copper tape track, those wheels might touch. You're like, yeah, I take your point there. It, it blew my mind to see that. So I wanted to, sh I wanted to show you guys that. Just like I had that. actually seen that picture, but I hadn't noticed that trait, that characteristic of the braid being so high. Yeah, if, and if you look at some of the other pictures that that guy shares of his cars on that track, you can see significant damage to the braids on the tracks. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, what did you want to share, Graham? Uh, my purchases. Nothing as good as a $20 cardboard box with a nice car in it, but... <laughs> oh, lately, I bought these in the past six weeks. There's a lot to take in there. Oh. <laughs> well, I got... Four fly Corvettes, you know, all brand new, nice. but they're old stock, right? Yeah, yeah, all brand new. I got two fly Lola T70s, that's good, and they're, they're just very nice cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else? Oh, in a little auction, I picked up these two East German cars, Trabants. Oh, wait, wait, uh, yeah, it was 30 Maybe some of those from Pro Tinker Toys. I know, I they're made by Revel actually. No, where no, I mean, the, the seller. The Corvette where you bought them. Uh, no, I bought it a Pro Tinker, yes. Pro Tinker in Ohio, is that who you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been on his site a few times. He had some really good prices on his flies. Well, he does. Those, those Lolas, He's, he sells them in bulk for like $20 a piece. Uh, so I was going to tell you, these were 20 bucks each in bulk. 35 if you wanted in the nice display box with the catalog and stuff. But $20 bulk. And they're just they're just gorgeous cars, mm -hmm. and really nice cars. And the two Trabants he had in an auction, I think what it is, I think he bought a hobby shop probably that had a whole like probably two hundred fly cars on display, and they were all in a. He bought the plexiglass boxes and everything, and the cars are brand new. And he has a whole bunch of fly cars that he just gets rid of sometimes. 
So these were in an auction. I got them for twenty dollars each. I thought they'd make a nice couple of hill climb cars, you know, mm -hmm. just small little tiny things. I think the wheels are like only ten centimeters or something, right? They're really tiny. I knew the fly. We had a four pack of vets going of the fly Corvettes for like a hundred bucks or something like well, that. You know what? New Year's Eve, this four pack went for eighty. Yeah. Eighty. I got twenty dollars a piece for the four fly Corvettes. Wow. wow. And, I couldn't turn that. I'm a. I own a C5 Corvette. I couldn't turn that down. Eh? And uh, the fly cars are always. He just listed ten more yesterday of the fly cars out of box. Twenty bucks. And what's this one at the front? The open cockpit. No, it's a. It's an SCX car, LMP car. Just on, it's an old SCX car mm -hmm. uh, brand, and just like these right. four. Sorry. It looks like a, a Cadillac LMP. Uh, it, it's, it's actually. Center. No, it's, that, it's it doesn't Ferrari. say what it is. Oh, it's a Ferrari. It's a Ferrari. 333? Yeah, it's yes. 333. Yeah. You know what? It doesn't say anything on it what it is. And it comes in a box with uh, with the Cadillac North Star back in the day. Oh, okay. So in one of, it come in a set. It never did. <clears throat> was released by itself. So they just have it as competition for the Cadillac LMP car in a pole position set. Again, he had tons of these. But... Um, and then these four are four-wheel drive Mitsubishi and Subaru cars. Yeah. Where I got the LMP and the four four-wheel drives is I met a guy on, on Facebook, lives up here in Canada in Edmonton, and he bought oh, probably 400 feet and of SCX digital from 10 years ago. And he got so much track. It's a big layout in his garage. And uh, he's got parts to last him for 20 years. So he doesn't matter if anything's old, you know, but he couldn't make these digital. And these are analog cars. And I had a digital, uh, I had an extra digital car from SCX like that. It was a club car for 2010. And this is analog, but I had an extra digital. So I just said, you know what? It's been sitting here for 10 years. And I sent it to him. Well, he sent me these four analogs and this uh, LMP car That's in exchange. Wow. So I just sent him the digital. I said, you can, Dwight, you can go use it. And I'd love to see it run. I've never used it. And uh, so he in turn said, well, I'll send you a couple of cars. Well, he boxed up these and sent them to me. So I was really grateful for that. <laughs> and I say those, these fly cars, $20. You can go to Pro Tinker and he's, he's got more. The Corvettes, I think, are $100 normally for four. So that's that's sort of my purchase. And, of course, that meant I had to go to Paul Gage Tires. And, mm. geez, I think I had two or three shipments of tires come in in the past while. But <laughs> <laughs> that's um, but that's been fun. Those, those cars are just awesome. So uh, there you go. Thanks for looking. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for showing. Good, good deals. Pro Tinker always has great deals. So if you're if you're looking for good deals on slot cars, protein. Oh, yes, good. he does. Oh, and he threw in for fun. I should show you for fun in the New Year's Eve thing. Oh, the one I got an H HO scale CUDA. Nice. And it runs on the copper track that I have, you know, yeah. my copper test track. It runs on that. And it's. Uh, because he's, he's really big in HO. He's got lots of 132nd, but he's big on HO stuff. And this was, I think, a custom-made CUDA where he had to buy like a 1,000. And he had it made in the livery he wanted, right? Can I see the front end on your CUDA? Yes, you can. Is it the... Uh... Is there a 71? Is it the shark nose? I can't see. It's not louvered, right? No, it is not. Okay, I was, I've, all, I've been looking for a louvered CUDA for a long time. Uh, there you but go. it's very nice. Anyway, that was, in the, that was in the bottom. That was a New Year's special he had. He does live broadcasts all the time. And he did a live New Year's Eve special. And when he came up with the four Corvettes for $80, buy it now. That was pretty impressive. You know? Hey, Graham, uh, I put one of those, uh, the red Trabant you have. 
I bought one of them on eBay last year, brand new in a box. And just a word of caution, the first time I put a battery to it, it spun the pinion. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I've, I had my I department oh, looked inside. Yeah, of course, they all needed, all of these cars needed greasing because those fly cars, they've been sitting in a container somewhere for 10 years or more. And they all took apart, they were all dry. So, uh, you know, they got greased and lubed and the braids got, the braids were all brand new, nothing used. So, and the Travents, I didn't get a box for them, but uh, I have seen them for sale, but. And they're gonna have, they're gonna have split plastic pinions all over the place for those older fly cars, those plastic pinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they give them some lube. I've, I've run them around, but I haven't, I haven't got my set, my track set up right now to, to give them a full run for half an hour, but I, I do have a, a copper test track, routed test track that I use, and they're uh, they're fun to run. Uh, Paul Gage didn't have tires for them though, that small, but so these are pretty hard. What well, well, pretty hard? You know, if, if, Graham, if you get your outdoor track set up again, take the Trabants and, and recreate the Berlin Wall coming down. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, and the celebration, you know, burnout. I did go. And, I did go and look up some videos on the Trabant because I'd never heard of it before. And I saw them, ra they race them apparently all over Europe. Oh yeah, I, I, I can guarantee you the slot cars drive better than the real thing. <laughs> oh God, they're There's awful. Lot, lots of guys had them out there and they just drive them little motors. Oh, just, yeah, it's it's quite something to see. But they'll be fun. Thanks that's very much. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, thanks for sharing, Graham. Does anybody else have anything they want to show and tell or? Yeah, I've got a few. All right, go ahead, Mike. Um, let's see, you can see the, oh, the yeah. uh, Sam Posey yeah. car. Yeah. I got that one, had to do a lot of work on the bottom. Did you slam that? You slammed that, didn't you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Not. It's only about 16th of an inch, something like that um, to do it, but it still isn't competitive with the 69 Camaros. So we'll see, I'll, I'll keep working on it. And then I got uh, the Ferrari. E4. Classic. Yeah. And the uh, Capri. <laughs> there. And then I got, I got some stock cars too, but those are, um, that's the Carrera. Carrera. FX or a Ferrari F XX. XX. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful car, but it weighs 108 grams. <laughs> it's just like Carrera. Oh, yeah. And that was the FXX is one of their cars from kind of a few years ago before they really started lightening things up. Yeah. But they're still heavy cars, even the new ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, then I got this. That's nice. I like that. Yeah. I did some interesting stuff with this. I, you know, uh, apropos to our discussion prior about magnets and such. So I did a, uh, well, I did some rework on my track, but so that the times are not really uh, comparable, but I took this out of the box and put it on the track with just the chip in it. So it was, you know, normal weight and you could barely drive the thing on the track. I mean, it was just awful. Um, and with the magnet in, and it did 11.4. I took the magnet out and the two laps that I could in could get in were 27 and a half seconds, more than double with the magnet out. Yeah. Uh, then I took, with the magnet out, I put on some Paul Gage tires that I had uh, from another uh, Mercedes that I've got that just dropped, dropped the whole axle in there. And that dropped it down to 13.8, which is about two seconds more, but it was still really touchy to drive. I mean, the, you barely touch it and the back end would come around like nothing. And, and then I tested out um, with, the, with the magnet back in um, with the Paul Gage tires on and I got 9.5. And my, my other one that I've got um, will go less than seven seconds. 
So, Mike, you need to take a look at the videos that I've got on my Facebook. I've got six of those running with non-magnet, uh, with N22 slotted rubber tires on, uh, lapping really well and really controllably, sliding but really controllably. That's all they seem to need with the body loosened. You know the usual tricks. I suspect your track might be really slippery. Well, it's a Scalex track. Um, yeah, on it, on the same track, track. Scale Electric Sport. Yeah, yeah. we got oh, those so going it's really well. Electric Scale Electric too. Yeah, yeah. I, w I wish I could show you, but um, I'll tell you what. If you look for Car Fun Mostly on YouTube, all one word, Car Fun okay. Mostly, you'll find my YouTube channel and somewhere in there, probably about a year back. I don't publish very much. You'll find probably find some clips of six of those running on a digital track, mm -hmm. Scale Electric Sport. And like I say, the spec is non-magnet with an N22 tire and everything else is standard. Mike, do you, we can get those going really well. Do you ever run silicone tires on your track, Mike? Yeah, I do. Stop it. It, it hasn't made any difference. Yeah, but, it has. Um, <laughs> You're showing it right now. <laughs> so, that? That, so, there's a, so to, to keep it short, if you run silicones, don't run anything other than silicones. Right. Right. I, you, I did for a while. And so now I'm all Paul Gage. Take it. Yeah. Take off those Complete. silicones. Never run them on your track again. Run, yeah. run regular rubber, run, you know, your things. Just never run those silicones on your track again. Uh, and with the, you know, pretty much for any tire type, if you run consistently that type of tire, you're generally going to have the best performance out of that type of tire. Mixing and matching different types of tires is, is risky. Sure. But can be done. Yeah. As you stay away from silicone yeah uh, but you'll probably find do you have a chewing machine yet oh yeah i've i've chewed them and and set them down and i use it to adjust the height for the for the magnetic forts too yeah. so you know i can i can do that okay. but my track is really well i've got two but there's the yeah. the track that i usually test on is about 84 foot long and it's got a whole bunch of s's and stuff in it um with about a uh 17 foot straight at the back um, but it's pretty it's pretty slick and the, the s is just wreak havoc with maglis <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean it's it, it you're you're still working on getting your trigger finger into into maglis racing and, there, and there's there's well you'll get better at that and that 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 difference there's always going to be a difference between magnet and maglis racing obviously sure. you're not going to be able to pick it out you're not going to be able to hit the gas at the same point in the in, at the exit of the turn as you can with a magnet car. Right. So but learning this to... was this was unbelievably terrible. I mean, oh, yeah. really, no, I could not go around the slightest corner with barely touching the throttle. It was just awful. Have Once I heard... changed the tires, it wasn't terrible. Next time, and what voltage are you running in there? Next, next time, you uh, have running car... stock. Let's go ahead. Next time you have a car that you don't necessarily want to change the tires on right away try a drop of three in one on each tire let it soak in you know mm -hmm. try try a little bit of wd-40 you know let that soak in wd-40 is quick but it doesn't last as long three in one takes longer to soak in but it lasts a little bit longer if you do it too much and the tire is going to turn gummy and fall apart but if you just if you have a tire that's got no grip do the buzz it on the sandpaper thing if it still doesn't have any grip rub some through rub a drop of three in one three in one oil onto each tire let it soak in for an hour or two and it'll probably be almost as good as those, you know, N22s or the Paul Gages. Mm -hmm. I have to oil them again every now and then to, to maintain that level of, of grip without yeah. having to change the tires. Yeah. Well, anyway, it was it was an interesting experiment that I did. Um, so we'll see. But Keep I finally got, on it. I, Keep doing I got it, yeah. those other, <laughs> yeah, I got the other, uh, 124 scale guys from the from the wood track out here and they really had a good time so uh, uh they're pretty they they bought cars already so here's here's hoping that's they're coming that's back fine. usually if they put if they put their money into it that's that's usually a good sign that they're interested in doing it some more yeah it, it, it sounds congratulations it sounds like you've made a conversion yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. They, they've at least come to digital. We'll see about the Maglis. I still have to get converted there, you know. I was going to say, if they're the coming from this version yet, so <laughs> if they're coming from a commercial track that uses glue, they're probably not going to want to do Maglis racing anytime soon. Yeah, 
Yeah, probably not right away. But they really, it was really fun to do some of my higher powered cars, which my other buddy doesn't use much. And, uh, but it, it was nice because there's very little carnage using the automatic track call. Um, so there was very little done there. And there was some tough racing. All three of us each won a race. And I sort of, I sort of spread the cars around to make sure that, you know, we had an even split as far as which cars were faster. Um, so it was, it was a really, really good time. It's nice to get back. Yeah. Looking forward to it myself. I did, I did dig out my track. So it almost looks as good as it does in my picture behind me. Uh, to start, <laughs> start playing around with the, um, uh, one mile challenge, which I think we talked about quite a few episodes ago, but it's, it's basically a, a onslaught forum there. I think there might be on doing in multiple forums now as well. But essentially, you get the exact length of whatever lane of the track you're going to run on and figure out how many laps makes an actual mile of racing. Oh, and, yeah. And then you challenge yourself to get the best lap time with various cars for that one mile of, of racing on your track. For my track, the inside lane is an odd amount of feet and inches. But the outside lane is a, is a perfect 55, which divides nicely into a mile 96 times. So I do exactly 96 laps and I have exactly a mile on my outside lane. So obviously that's the easy choice. I'm not going not gonna to race yeah. extra length just to get that. <laughs> but I can do exactly 96 laps and get exactly a mile on my outside lane. It's the better lane anyways, generally speaking. So I'm, yeah. I'm playing, with, playing around with that, um, but I have to do some border work on my track I, I still got some bump borders the guy who the guy who prints and sells flat border inserts still has bumped borders on his track yeah i need to talk to you about that i've got some that are causing problems yeah so so i'm i'm finishing up the process of replacing all those and and i also had the right here let's see right here where you see a thing let's see there we go right there whatever that thing is on the track i don't even know what that is on the track shadow it's a shadow it is a shadow. Yep, I have a light just above that. So, so right there where that shadow happens to be is a bad, or was, I've already fixed it, but when I did my track power tapping where I soldered little jumper wires between every single join yep. in the track, I held the soldering iron a little bit too long at that join and it melted the plastic and allowed the rail to pop up. Uh, and so I so I kind of temporarily fixed that by forcing it down and trying to flow a little solder in there to help keep it down, put a little copper tape over it, stuff like that. But inevitably it kept popping up. And when I uncovered my track and started to attempt 96 laps in a row, some cars <laughs> helped that pop back up. And I'm like, forget that, I'm fixing this stupid thing. And it just so <laughs> happens that, that on the next track over is where there's no jumpers because that's that's one of my power tap sections. So I only had to undo uh, two sets of soldered connections to replace that bad join. Mm. And so instead of when I put that back together with fresh track, instead of soldering them again, I pinched the ends of the wires under the little tabs rather than soldering the wire to the tabs. So hmm. I'm hoping that that is just as good over a long term, but it was, it was, it's it's still only two joins worth of worrying about the track being the, the only electrical connection. If those wires fail, that's that's just one join. The entire rest of the track is tapped. So it, it, I don't think I'll ever notice a problem in that area again. Yeah. But yeah. So I've, used, I've used some um, radio connectors. You know, they, they have uh, gold, gold, supposedly gold plated uh, connectors for um, using car radios and stuff like that. And those fit on the little tabs. Oh, um, space where you plug them on and then just a quick solder is really very little heat to it. Works yeah. really well. Yeah, yeah you can make jumper I mean, wires easy I'm that way too. Budget minded. So I was just going with some scrap wire that I had on hand. I had, I had wire, I had solder. I, I do it that way <laughs> but i probably won't do it that works again. yeah it worked mine worked that worked whatever you're talking about that would work too so yeah i mean but you know there's never any power problems on my track which is which is fantastic it was worth the trouble but i don't want to go through that trouble again if i don't have to 
but yeah, I was, the, the one mile challenge is, is a blast. So anybody who's interested in, in solo racing or has no other choice than solo racing, that's a fun way to do some solo racing with a goal. So, so Greg, you were saying that 55 feet is 96 laps and that's a, that's a mile? That's what my calculation was. What was your time? Uh, I haven't been able to, to do a whole lot of practice and primarily I'm doing maglist, but I got nine and a half minutes or something like that with, with my Mr. Slot car. Uh, I'm gonna try that. It's fun, yeah. I mean, and it's and so it's, I got to I got to beat nine and a half minutes. <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem for you, but yeah. You Good thing you're not competitive, love. <laughs> and that, and one of the, the fun thing, well, not so fun, but the, for the those who love data, when you when you submit your results, you basically you post a post a picture or something that you know shows what your lap times were, or at the very least. Uh, your best lap and the total time for completing the number of laps and how many laps that that were. And then of course the car, you know, this was a Skelectric, blah, 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 and magnets, no magnets, what kind of tires, that kind of thing, just they put it in a database. And then you go to a Google form where it, take, it steps you through a real simple, you know, yes or no question, kind of multiple choice things, you know, you know, magless or magnet, uh, you know, well, what kind of car, what kind of tires, all that kind of stuff. What was your best lap time, all this kind of stuff. And then it automatically moves that, that Google form entry into a database where you, it's a leaderboard and everything. You get to see, you know, who's, who's done the best lap in a Magless car. And um, even more interesting okay. is they that came up with a way to scale the difficulty of the track. So you can't just slap down a really long oval and think that you're going to be as good as the guy with the technical track. So with with the information about your track, you know the the radius of the turns that put together the track and all that kind of stuff. There's a difficulty rating. I'm not entirely sure how that works. My rating is 120 something, 122. I don't know really well, what that is in the in the list of ratings. But then at least you have a comparison. You, can, you don't have to look at uh, the person who's got a really great time and think, oh, well, I suck, but in reality, you're pretty good because your track is really technical and theirs is really easy. It's so, sort of a which, best performance. Which forum is this on? Uh, it's, I've been doing it on Slot Forum, Slot Forum International, slotforum.com. Yeah, I, haven't, I haven't seen it anywhere else. It sounds interesting. What do you do about de-slotting? It just, it just goes towards your, your total time. So obviously you want to not de-slot at all. Yeah. Uh, my first attempt, I de-slotted like five or six times. And of course, you know, I'm like over here and then I'm going around to pick up a car and then I, I race, I'm using my wireless controller so I could race from anywhere, but then I'm not in my normal spot. So I'm not getting as good a lap times. So, so ideally I want to race from my normal spot. So I have the, the point of view I'm used to and mm -hmm. never crash because every crash is going to add to your total time. Okay. So yeah, no no pausing the clock when you crash. You got to go put your car back on and just hope that you don't do, crash. Do you run a scale mile or a full mile? An actual linear mile. You are that's why you measure your track. So yeah. you're doing however many laps it takes for your tiny little car to go on actual 5500 whatever feet of actual distance on your. Well, track. I I know it's a bit of a moot point, but is it a standing start or a flying start? I think that's a moot point. I, I oh, okay. you know, but most timing systems, okay, well, the timing systems that I use primarily start the first lap time when you cross the, the line the first time. And right, so, but that, that'll, that'll affect your time though, whether your first lap, for, I mean, mi minusculely, I admit. Yeah, so I, I, think it's, I think you just have to deal with however your timing system deals with it and try to get a good start. You know, if your timing system starts the count, starts the timer, and then, I mean, obviously you don't want to kind of be a douche about it. And, and you know, if you're, if you're, if your timing system counts a lap, the very first time you cross it, you don't want to put your car right behind the line, just so, it's, you know, you get a 0 0.01 second first lap. But at the same time, you don't want to put your car halfway around the track and the timer starts when, when it says go. And so you have, you know, well, actually, no, that's, it, I mean, it depends on your system, right? So my system, 
doesn't start the lap counting until I cross the line the first time, and that's zero. And then it counts again when I you know, count to one the second time I cross the line. So ideally for me, I want to uh, start, the, start the race and then time it perfectly so that I'm crossing the line when it says go. <laughs> because if I cross the line sooner, that's a jump start and it would, it would complain <laughs> at me for doing that. So if I get if I can get a flying start and, and hit the line right as it says go, then that's going to be a perfect start to the race. But and we're discussing most of that, that maybe a second over nine and a half minutes. I mean, yeah, it's that's that's going to be the least impactful thing of your total time of, of yeah. It. You know, with nine or ten offs, it really doesn't make much difference. Exactly. Yeah. You know, don't come off. Keep your laps consistent, and you'll, <laughs> you'll get the best time. Looks like I gotta do 58 laps. Based what I'm thinking your track is like, that sounds about right. Yeah, 87 for me. Yeah, I'm gonna try yeah. it. Yeah, I'm gonna try it too. Sounds like fun. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, that's why I ask. I, I, ours is 55 and it's 96 laps. That's that's worth a shot. But but here's the thing: I don't have to, set, for example, with the race system that we have, because you you have a very valid point about how your system is set up. Um, I could set it up as a practice session and have a flying start so that the, the, the time will only start once I cross the start finish line. Do it, John. Or, or what you can do at the end of the race, John, just subtract five tenths of a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gonna know. Just send in whatever time you want. <laughs> yep. The you spend too much time gaming the system. <laughs> yeah, spend more time driving your car. <laughs> And I don't know if it's a requirement that you post a picture of your of your timing system and it's showing your, your your total time, but that's fairly common on the thread is people posting a picture of their car along with a picture of their timing system, either like a picture of their TV screen that show their computer screen or whatever that shows their lap timer, or a picture of their little you know dedicated hardware lap timer system thing or whatever, you know, whatever system you got, if you can do the number of laps and get a total amount of time for that number of laps then that's a perfectly valid way to do it. I've just found it on Slot Forum. Looks like it's been going on for about a year already. <laughs> it started, really? it started yeah. kind of early pandemic lockdown time. 23rd of April, doing... or 22nd of April, the first post on that, on yeah. that thread. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Shows you, shows you how long it was since I was last on Slot Forum. <laughs> what, Lloyd? <laughs> yeah. I... I had a go at it when it first started or about a month after it started. And I guarantee I have the slowest lap time of anybody. <laughs> well, yours, your track is pretty technical too. How, how did they come up with a difficulty rating for your track? Well, they didn't back then, they weren't doing that. Oh, okay. early, on, though, early on, it wasn't very scientific. And yeah. uh, I, I think my, lap, my overall time is about 22 minutes. I can <laughs> see that on your track. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, it was just fun. Oh yeah. At that, I mean, at that time, it was just a bit of fun. And it's and it and when it comes down to it, it's since everybody's track is different, you know, regardless of the difficulty rating, you know, and everybody's cards are going to be slightly different, you know, it's just a fun way to kind of say, you know, I'm I'm I did really good, but more more so, it's it's a goal oriented way to challenge yourself to drive your cars better or to tune your cars. To drive better and the combination of the two and stuff like that so i'm sure i'll slap a magnet car on my track a few times and see see how crazy of a of a <laughs> one mile time i can get some of the guys were were challenging themselves to beat eight minutes you know could they do their one mile in less than eight minutes Greg, i don't think you're any uh you're no longer qualified to race magnets so don't even try <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly not that's for sure <laughs> So I'll be, I'll definitely not be high on the leaderboard of the magnet group. That's for sure. Yeah. We don't want any injuries here. Yeah. I don't want to, I'll, I'll break my finger finger. <laughs> if you put magnets in Greg, you'd be pulling that rail up again. No, I fixed yeah. it. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what pulled it up because I was, you know, half the reason I dug out the track is because I got, you know, those new cars not too long ago. And I'm like, well, I got to pull some laps with these things. And, you know, I usually don't pull the magnet out right away. So I, they just all went around the track with the magnets. And uh, 
Of course, I already crashed that slot wings, uh, you know, march that I got because <laughs> it comes with magnets and it doesn't have a whole lot of traction. So I'm coming around the, the, the penultimate turn uh, or actually the final turn a little bit too hot. And of course, as soon as it starts sliding, it lets go and hits the hits the wall. Oof. The uh, broke the wing, broke the rear wing. <laughs> no shelf queens. No, never. No shelf queens. Like a friend of mine used to say, they're all doomed. They're all doomed. <laughs> they're all doomed. We might as well wrap them. Yep. And the, the pile of little bits of car parts is, is yeah. a, an honorarium to all the. I have a special drawer in my slot box for all the pieces that have come off. Yeah, I've got two or three of those. <laughs> I have a box of of wing of parts of wings and mostly mirrors. Yeah, mostly. mirrors that come off of everybody's cars that comes to race here. And while yeah, Mike most... was talking, while Mike was talking earlier about getting the the the, um, the commercial track guys interested, uh, all of my friends who came here. Uh, from the commercial tracks, I never let them. I never let them find out about magnets, so they don't know anything about magnets. They're quite happy to drive without magnets. So that's your mistake, Mike. You just, you just say here, this is how slot cars are. Well, it wouldn't have made any difference because it's copper. <laughs> it's copper braid, so that's true. It's a wood track. Yeah. yeah. Don't tell them about the wood magnets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the nice thing is, is that they, they race pretty quickly. So I had some good competition. They, oh, they yeah, that, that's right away. They will I mean, pick it up quickly. A friend of mine runs, uh, runs uh, with magnetic braid. And those same guys that run here, uh, when they run there, uh, a lot of them are very quick straight away because they're quite used to the, the, res the response times and the reaction times that you need on a magnet track. I was going to yeah. say, they've got, they've got quick response times there. No I'll tell you, when you come from HO racing and you pick up 132 scale and then go non-magnet straight away, it feels really, really easy yeah. to do yeah. until until you go up against a good competition. Yeah. Speaking but it can of be that... very good fun at very low speed, can it not? I mean, mm -hmm. 1800k yeah. motors are more than... I mean, even if the cars are not seemingly all that fast you can still have some really good racing well as long as the cars are all equally fast or equally yeah. slow you get good racing right yeah yeah, yeah absolutely right. yeah i mean some of the best tra some of the best races we have on on my track we have uh three or four of the old revel monogram uh, classic stock cars the, the fair lanes and uh, galaxies <clears throat> we put some some silicon tires on the back and we upgraded the, the gears a little and they're these great lumbering chattering things but we have more fun with those because they're all the same speed and we have an amazing amount of fun with those things like racing ninko classics same kind yeah. Of thing. Yeah. yeah yeah same thing yeah so dennis you were basically doing redline 7000 yeah <laughs> Well, that was my idea with having the stock. I got three of the stock cars, so yeah. I'm going to set those up. Although I really, really, really had to slam the Dodge in order to get it to work. Uh, ooh. Yeah, we've used the Galaxy, and, and quite a, in my track anyway, the 63 Galaxy is the is the car to have because it's yeah. the biggest and the widest and the longest. Now you got to find a Mini to beat it. <laughs> you know, then they have the, yeah. the duels at Goodwood with the minis. At Goodwood, the yes, yeah. <laughs> we had a guy in South Africa who raced a 63 Galaxy for a long time. It was one of John Wilman's cars that was left in South Africa at one stage. And this fellow, Bob Altoff, he raced that. And, um, it, you know, we had this, the, the, the race circuit close to me was Kyalami, which had it's a, it's a two and a half mile circuit and re, and about a mile and a bit of that is pretty much downhill straight away. Yeah. Uh, it has a kink in the middle of it, but uh, that's about it. And so that, that seven liter galaxy used to get up to some really significant speed. Uh, the big problem was that it didn't stop. Yeah. I mean, he, he yeah. actually worked with the air, with the airlines, the guys at, at the airline workshops at one stage to try and put disc brakes on the front of it 
uh, to get the thing to stop because the 63 Galaxy with its old drum brakes will not stop at the end of that no. amount straight away. No, that was that was the definition of brake fade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The kink yeah. in the middle was of the straight was his breaking point. Well, yeah, just about. I mean, the problem was it, the, the track came downhill yeah. Yeah. through the kink. It had a slight uphill under the past the pits, under the Dunlop Bridge, and then down again, and then a little bit of an up before you got to the the turn at the end of the at the end of that straightaway. But like I said, it was nearly a mile from the from the top to the bottom, and uh, there was just no way that thing would stop when he got there. <laughs> uh, wasn't Bob Oltoff one of the Cobra uh, wrenches? He ran uh, he ran a Cobra, and uh, he and he and his son started a company that made um, Cobra replicas in South Africa. And oh, they're, that's now, they're now based in, in North Carolina. It's a company called Superformance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So his, his son, Dan, who's also Dennis, like I am, uh, his son runs that company now. Bob Altov passed away some years back already. Yeah, and, Bob's, Bob drove the Wilburn Cobra Coupe. Correct. Oh, okay. Yes. Correct. Very successfully. He had the Cobra. He had the, the Cobra Coupe, and uh, he had an open Cobra. I think a two eighty nine. I don't think it was a four twenty seven. Uh, there were two eighty nines. He had a two eighty nine Cobra as well, uh, and he also ran a McLaren Alva for a while. Uh, one of the early, well, always with Ford engines. So he he was a big Ford guy. So his his McLaren had a Ford engine in it. It's Lloyd that was doing the sanding. Yeah, something sorry. Doing something, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we heard it earlier and wondered I, what it was just before the recording I, began. I, I for, forgot I had the mute off. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. okay. We thought you were cooking, Lloyd. <laughs> hey, can I ask Leo a, a question quickly while I think about it? Uh, Leo, was it you that showed that 3D printed guide uh, a, a week or two back where the post was part of the flag? Yes. Okay. The, 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 um, the guide was retained by a screw coming down through the chassis into the guide. And there was a gap in the blade for the screw to go into. Oh, no, not, too sure, not too sure yeah. why it was done that way, but um, I actually used a shorter screw so, so my screw didn't reach the full depth of the guide, uh -huh. and there's a bit of a gap. But the, was that it? The, the actual post of the guide was was part of the flag rather than part of the top of the guide, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a very it was a 1.4 millimeter threaded bolt mm -hmm. that went into the um, wow. the the flag. So it was quite it was very thin. Didn't make any difference to the. Um, Do you know where one can get the where one can get the file? Is that file available to print? Yes, um, the the chap who designed it is on the Carrera Go forum in Germany. Um, his 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 ID on the forum is something like Boro B O R O something. His name is Dusan, D U S A N uh, Dubrovnik or something like that. Yes. Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll message you the details. All right. he, seems, he seems to be quite happy to um, uh, provide people with the file. It's right. one forty third scale. Oh, well, I can fit, scale it up. That's not a problem. Yeah, to fit a Carrera Go um, Porsche 911. And it was for this proxy event that he was hosting, which is um, designed around the, the chassis. Um, oh. So that you can... You can do only limited things to the car, but it must have um, his design chassis, 3D printed. I, see. I think that was okay. the idea. All right, thanks very much. That's great, great info. Uh, I wanted to address a, a question that Wayne Pepper had posted in the chat. I think it was last week, could have been a week before. Uh, but right before he had to go, he had a question. I think we've touched on this in the past, but basically he asked, uh, what is the best type of paint to use on a Carrera track? And in the past, I believe the answer had always been the absolute bottom shelf cheapest latex, aka emulsion paint that you can possibly buy. Uh, and that's because the chemicals used in those cheap ass paints 
respond really well to plastic. Well, no, it's it's also it's also the high rubber content. Yeah, and like and good, so good grip. Good yeah. yeah, good yeah. grip. Yeah, and you know, I I the the question was triggered uh, as a topic for me because I recently saw somebody talking about painting their track and how 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 much trouble they would go through to to like you know, wipe it down with acetone and then run a butane flame over it and all this kind of stuff to, to like make it ready to, 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 to for paint the stick or something. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I, that must depend on the paint or if you've been sloshing all kinds of oils on your track or something. But I've got on my track, my pit lane is painted with super cheap, gray paint my portable track is painted with that same super cheap gray paint and it's it, they're both doing fine and i didn't do anything special you know obviously i didn't have you know I, I wiped the track off so there wasn't anything on it but i didn't flame it or use fancy chemicals or anything it's just and, and greg did, did you paint borders as well or are they genuine black borders about half and half yeah so <coughs> so i'm in america so i had I had access to the wonderful black borders that Skelectric sold for a brief period of time. So about half of my borders are the genuine black ones. The rest are tan ones that I've spray painted with um, Plasti Dip spray. So basically the rubberized spray paint. Ah, yeah, then, the peel off stuff. The peel off stuff, yeah. And then, and it sticks pretty well the, it, without peeling off generally. Um, but I'm also replacing the, the bumped curbs with the 3D printed. Yeah, the flat ones. Flat ones. But how how is how have the different paints survived on your sport track and your I mean, borders? You know, depending on how much, how many cars that are running on the track that have wheel or tires that are barely bigger than the spur gear, generally <laughs> speaking, it holds up pretty well. Uh, the 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 only damage generally to any of the borders is where it's a bumped curb, and cars with with you know really small tires and big spur gears have been running over it and so the spur gear scratches off the paint or the or the uh, the plastic so you do spray. still have some bump curbs in there then not for long but yes yeah I, okay. I basically i had replaced all of the all of the curb all of the outside borders were replaced yeah. with with the flat curbs because that's generally where the car is going to be sliding and then a, a border or two beyond that for when the car is doing a little bit of fishtailing on its way out of the turn. Those were all flat for years, but now I'm just replacing them all. So I'm not going to have any bump curbs anywhere ever again. <laughs> and I'm yeah, throwing them in the garbage. <laughs> the bump curbs only be, only really belong on the apexes on the insides of the turns. I, I dislike the bump curbs on the outside borders. And myself. honestly, only for, only, for the red, only for the red and white sprightness of it. I, I've been tempted to print multicolor inserts with red and white plastic now on the on the outside I, I for me there shouldn't be a curve on the outside it should just well, be no, a, potentially a white line but that's all yeah uh, so and, and the curves the curves with the colors belong on the inside yeah for realism for sure yeah and on my portable track i use i didn't use any borders at all i use a, a carpet underlayment that's the same thickness as electric track to to fill in between the track and then I painted red and white on where the car would be crossing on the racing line, you know, on those inside returns and stuff like that. But yeah, I agree with you. And but generally, but for for plastic track, I just want it all flat. I don't want the car to hit a bump anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. And what brought back what brought the what brought back the thing about painting plastic track again? Well, I saw just a post on Slot Forum. Somebody was yeah. talking about um, I think somebody who, who just recently got back into the hobby who acquired some used track or pulled his used track out of the attic or something like that started talking about how do I, you know, what do I do to my track and stuff. And somebody mentioned, you know, what yeah. had been done a long time ago about painting track and how you had to prepare for it and stuff like that. And, and then I remember Wayne had asked about, you know, what paint to use on his Carrera track. So I felt I that was a topic of discussion. I think maybe on the old Scalex Classic track, you've got to be a little more careful because that stuff, I don't know that um, the paint ad adhered as well to that as it does to the modern tracks. Well, well it was a rougher finish, wasn't it? <clears throat> any of the uh, Scaly track is polypropylene based, where all the, uh, you know, Carrera and Ravel and Art and all stuff, that's all styrene based. 
So any styrene-based track, you can paint with just plain latex emulsion on the other side of the pond paint. It sticks like it sticks. It sticks great, but um, a little more difficult with the scaly stuff. There is another. There is another paint if people want to really spend money on it because it's expensive. It's called UMA, mm -hmm. which is a urethane modified acrylic. Uh, it comes from. Uh, it was a company that was called XIM, which is now part of Rustoleum, uh, and it's a. It's designed as a primer for hard to paint surfaces. So it has a very good adhesion. And I know that a lot of the guys in, um, that I used to race with up in, in Colorado that had plastic tracks would paint with that because it never came up. Uh, the, the, the only problem with it was number a couple of problems. Number one, it's expensive. It's like $43 a gallon or something. And uh, number two, it's white. And so you have to tint it. And uh, you, you know, the, the paint people will tell you straight away, oh, you can't tint this or you get rid of the, the properties. And <laughs> you have to tell them, uh, actually, yeah, I, I can tint it and I want it to tint it. Um, but uh, it comes out a pretty nice gray is what I've got on my track. And the, the advantage of it seems to be that the urethane that they put into the acrylic uh, gives uh, better grip across it a number of different types of tire. So I can run on my track, I can run silicon tires and rubber tires and urethane tires one after the other and not really have one affect the other at all. Yep. I, I mean, the, the, latex, the cheap latex that I got has been working great on my sport track. Oh, yeah. My yeah. paint that I've used that comes up easily is spray paint. I, I tried some orders by just spray painting them with regular old rattle can spray paint and that just chips right off and doesn't doesn't have any adhesion whatsoever. But the plasti dip spray and the, the latex, you know, interior house paint, cheap paint, those those have been holding up pretty well. And mm -hmm. they're cheap enough that who cares if I've got to take a brush. Yeah, especially if the really cheap stuff is the better stuff to use. Yeah. It's one of the Oh you muted sorry, yourself, one, of, one of the few times in our lives that we that we actually get better value out of cheap stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, I always say, you know, and it, it lasts forever. I mean, I bought a gallon of this stuff. And oh, sure. I, it still feels like a gallon. You know, I've already I've painted tracks in it. And of course, with the Plasti Dip, if it does chip, I understand with Plasti Dip, you could just reapply over the, rip, over the, 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 the damage and it will remelt the area that was damaged and, you know, recombine and dry again and it'll be as good as new. Yeah. That's I mean, the thing about Plasti Dip because they use, a, they use it a lot on aluminium alloy wheels for cars, don't they? They choose to yep. go back and just any curb damage, pss, another, another little coat and it'll all blend back together. Or if they want to change the color of the Plasti Dip, they just peel it off. Yeah. <laughs> like a, yeah. like a well-fitting rubber glove and just throw it away and put another coat on of something else. Yeah. Good. So... In this case, uh, save as much money as possible when you buy your paint, Wayne. <laughs> well, it does seem to be the Carrera track that I see that's been painted most of all. And the reason I think for that is the dotted white line and its desirability factor, shall we call it. And, but and there, uh, yeah, I did yeah, see yeah. an experiment on Scale Electric Sport Track where someone had painted one piece and it was a straight piece and they put it in a track that we raced on. So we couldn't identify any change in grip. But as the meeting progressed, the paint did start to come off and it was straight. And I don't know what the paint was, wasn't involved in the experiment, but I witnessed it and I was part of it and it was a big fail. So I don't know what they'd used. In what, yeah, in what, in what way did it come up? Um, like did it flake off? Little, li I didn't see paint dust lying around. I didn't see it wrapped around anyone's tires. It didn't come off all at once. It came off in a very patchy way. I might try and find a photograph. I may actually have a photograph, not because of that piece of track, but I may have a photograph with it in. And it was painted gray. And like I say, it was, a, I think it was a, it might've been a crossover lane changer. Uh, so there might've been some slightly sideways action on it. Okay. And so digital cars with magnets or no magnets? Yes. Uh, no magnets. Stock electric tires. Stock tires. 
Yeah. The, the, the other reason you paint Carrera track, Wayne, is actually to reduce the uh, if unpainted Carrera track really gets statically charged and you can't clean it for love or money. Oh, yeah. So the paint ah. really takes that takes that problem right yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, regarding static charge in a plastic track, when I was a kid, my my parents' record collection used to have a velvet wiper. And inside that velvet wiper, you would put some drops. So what is that fluid? Because reducing static is a desirable... Yeah, it was, it, it, I, well, on LPs, it was basically uh, alcohol-based. Used, used to work for a record company. So that's, it was some sort of alcohol-based fluid that would basically... Um, take up whatever was on your on your LP and uh, not leave any residue. Yeah, and dry it dried immediately if it was even able to get all the way through the pad. So it was just that it was just yeah alcohol base. It's not actually got any anti-static qualities then. I had not ever heard that being mentioned, but most of the time people are wanting to cover that ugly white stripe and <laughs> and the borders that are you know worse worse than the scholastic borders as far as the red and white stripiness of it. It's, it's, well, and, and to your point, Greg, the older ones were yellow. yellow. Right? They had awful yeah. yellow stripes on them as well, yeah. Yeah, it's like, what were you thinking? And my, my career track, I have, a, I have a specific layout and it's all, I got borders and everything to go with it, all, all original career, but some of it's older, some of it's newer. So some of it's red and, uh, red and white and some of it's yellow and black. And it's like, you know, one of these days that when I put, Next time I put that down, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and tape over the rails and, and paint that whole thing gray because it looks so much better. It looks like a it looks so much better in every way. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the static charge is 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 a factor with the Carrera stuff for sure. You remembered that, did you, John? I did. Well, again, that was we learned this from Chris when we were we were putting our track together, which is documented. Uh, and oh my gosh, what a world of difference! Because we even tried half with and half without, and you know, the half without was like, well, it was like Leo talking about ice on close to his house trying to get to get up the street. Because it just attracts all the dust. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, does anybody have anything else before I dig into my topic, Ben? Just before we finish the static thing, has anyone ever lost a digital chip to static electricity? I got to go, guys. Okay, see you, Russ. Got a meeting, I got area two. Okay, take as care. Far, as far as I know, I've never lost a chip to static electricity. Mm. I've lost chips to doing stupid things like putting a battery to the motor leads while the chip was still attached. So I backfed DC into the motor output of the chip. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Then other stupid things to that burns chips, but fortunately very few, or very seldomly, and not static as far as I know. Mm. Uh, static could could cause odd, odd behavior. I mean, if you're, if your track is just covered with static and it's, and your cars are being wonky, then I guess that's something to look into. Mo most of the time, car chip oddities, if they're, if they're, if they're not related to something else going wrong with the system, controller oddities or computer oddities or whatever, then it's usually because the car traveling around the track is, is arcing as it passes over gaps in the rails that lane changers and stuff like that and so those arcs most most cars scholastic scholastic cars specifically come with uh what we call ferrite man which is a, a yeah. low pass filter right uh to help reduce the effect of those arcs and at, at one point with the really early scholastic digital chips that one wasn't enough. They 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 mm. put two or three or four ferrite men in a row to try to dissipate all of those arcs, uh, and even that wasn't enough until Skelectric, you know, redesigned their chip to fix that issue. Uh, and there's other things that you can do to reduce that issue. But if you're if your car's running around and arcing all over the place, it's gonna go wonky at some point. Either either just dead stop or go off at full speed because it thinks it's on an analog track or some stu something stupid. Mm. Mm. But yeah. I'm awesome. surprised no one mentioned the oxygen digital chip because I've been involved in a race that did cost a lot of oxygen digital chips and never knew exactly what took them out. Oh, really? I, I remember... They're spendy too. I remember some uh, on one of the disco events, there was, there was a bit of... That is probably what I'm referring to because I've been to three of those now 
And the one that I wasn't involved in, uh, I witnessed a team that eventually went home because I think they used up five oxygen chips in one race. I haven't seen it since. I, I, but I did see seeing, it. I remember seeing some of those. I forget what what it was if if it was ever nailed down as to what the cause was. But one thing to keep I in mind know. with those oxygen events is that those guys this it's practically wide open. And so those guys are doing crazy things with their cars and chassis and chips and things, you know, like to make them easy to swap out. And, you know, they've got like modular chassis and, you know, all kinds of crazy some of those. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, you're, you know, you're pushing the envelope. So the envelope's going to break every now and then, (laughs) but. Well, the, the, the motors they run on those are the yellow flat six. The, the basic flat six uh, slotted motor and the SIMX 16, which I think is a 21 and a half K FC 130 uh, base motor. Yeah, it's not, it's not there aren't any frames. boxer motors in there. It's just those two, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, it's not they're like not, wide open, but I mean, like the, like yeah. there's, there's multiple classes in those events. You know, some of them are more restrictive than others. Some of them are much more open, but there's going to be no, there's, there's, of tires. There's, there's three classes. Three classes. There's a yeah. There's three classes, and they use either the flat six or the SIMX 16. It's just yeah. those two motors. But the but there are the three classes have different levels of 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 specifications. They might all have either one of you know one or one of those motors, and they might all have the same tires. But otherwise, the rules are not the same between the the three classes. And as oh, I recall, no, there's, the there's classes, just three sets of rules. I there's just three sets of rules. I understand. Three sets of rules. I get it. Three yeah. sets of rules. And most of them have to use the same kind of tire. Most of them have a choice between those two motors. But yeah. otherwise, the rules are, are very different from one another the, of the three sets of rules, right? So you've got like open LMP. I don't remember the names of the classes, but you've got an LMP type class where they can do quite a bit to their car. It's not just an out of the box car with a boxer motor and NSR uh, or, or N22 tires. No, the, the right. rules are not written that way. The rules are written so that any car goes and because of that, people scratch build. Yes. That's, that's In plastic. the point I'm trying to make. That's the point yeah. I'm trying to make. So there are yeah. teams that do a lot of experimental things with their car. I still don't understand race. why that would cause a, a, a team to lose several chips. I mean, it's a it's a thing that in the in the past now, but I just wondered whether static might have been the re, might have been link in there. What was the track, Wayne? Ninko. Ninko track, yeah, with the nylon groove. Yeah, generally, um, static is an issue with the styrene based track, which is Carrera and Arton and things like that. Polypropylene based, which is Ninko. Um, Styrene, also polystyl. You, you won't have the, the level of anywhere near the level of static on a scaly sport or an info track that you will end up on a styrene based mm, track. Mm. I know yeah. there are bigger minds at work or have been at work on this before I ever came to it. And, and, and the problem is not significant enough to be a big problem. No, and I know there have been a couple of uh, variations of the chips since the early days of its running. But I was there in, I think it was, I'm going to say 16, uh, where I didn't race, and I, it was my first visit, and I saw a team that eventually I think went home because they'd lost a number of digital chips. Mm-hmm. Here's here's let me kind of make a story out of my line of thinking here. So so there's a team, my team. And we're doing it, we're running an experimental chassis. We're, we're doing carbon fiber, we're doing rattle pans, we're doing all sorts of crazy stuff that we think is going to help us win. We're not, we're not doing anything to the chip, obviously, that would be dumb and probably illegal. We're not doing anything to the motor, we're running, we're, we're running within the rules. But our chassis has all kinds of craziness and, and awesomeness that we think is going to help us win. And we run the wires in a convoluted way to, to, you know, help things or prevent from hindering things or whatever. And without having already done hundreds of laps on a mile, on a, on a scale quarter mile track, we didn't know 
that the things that we did to our chassis were going to result in wires shorting. And we, we didn't see that that's what was happening until we had already replaced five chips. That's, not, that's kind of what I'm saying is a possibility in that kind of event. It could be a possibility, Greg, know. but from my perspective, I'm, I'm not jumping on board with you on that one. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not saying that. No, no, I, 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 I'm uh, sort of in the camp that the chassis and its construction and flexibility and stuff is not going to be a major factor at all in any blown chips. Mm. My understanding is, is, uh, and I'm going to have to apologize for failure to cite all my sources, but here at my house, you know, we, we race magnet. First, for you listeners that have heard that there's no magnet racers, there, there are a few magnet racers in the world. I'm one of them. And, uh, Me too. And, and I enjoy it. And I, I do have a We few love you cars. too. Yeah. I got a few cars that, that uh, don't have magnets in them. So I, I am playing around with that. But on the chip front, we had a guy here, he lost three chips in an EV. And it turned out that inside his motor, somehow his arm was shorting out. It, the motor would run for a while and then he'd start having problems and the car was cutting in and out and all kinds of stuff. And then the chip would blow and right. then move the chip to another car and it wouldn't work. So then we'd go get another chip and he'd put it back in his car and it'd take off. You know, and it, and it seemed to be fine when it was in analog mode, uh, you know, and, and he, he, it was too intermittent to just reproduce the motor problem it was having. But ultimately, he switched out to another car. And later, um, I was turning his back wheels, and they kind of locked, but there was nothing in the gear. So something inside the motor was hanging up. And whatever was happening, he changed the motor out. And since then, that car has run and it's got one chip in it. And on my track, which is, you know, 96 feet, he's run, you know, 800 laps on this thing and never had another problem with that car. But that motor problem, and then later on, I was Googling around and somebody said something about shorts and motors and or motor overloads that could blow chips. So if a team lost a bunch of chips in one night, I suspect it's more that than anything. And I've got I, chips. I'm inclined to agree. It, the, the likelihood of a yeah. motor fail, yeah, yeah. is I've probably. Got, yeah, I've got, you know, I, I started in this scale electric stuff late, 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 late 2013. And I think 2015 is when I, I bought my uh, digital platinum set, the six car set maybe it was 2015 but anyway you know i've got chips from back then that are still in cars and as a matter of fact the car that that uh, tom was having trouble with we put an older chip in there after he put the motor in and he ran that for quite some time and then he moved back up to a the i think the h revision chip which seems to have a little more punch coming out of the hole than than that original can based uh Oh, we're back on yes, electric sport chip, yeah, yeah. The H that's, revision chip. That's, that's my experience with the yeah. whole what happens to chips. That's that's and, a fantastic example. And the, honestly, I was kind of going on the assumption that a team who is competing in the Disca event, which I know for a fact that they usually have two cars, they've got their their main car and then they've got a spare car, had done already that. If they're going, if they're burning two chips, probably the first thing that they thought of after burning the second chip was maybe it's a duff motor. And so they swapped out the motor or they switched to their other car and they started losing other chips. I wasn't, I wasn't close enough to that team to, 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 to know, but there are, you do, you are supplied with a number of motors. It might be three, I think per team, and you can get through 24 hours on one. Yeah. The, the, they're not meant to fail there. You get multiple mm. motors in case something like that happens. So I just exactly. Kind of assume yeah. That they had yeah. already swapped out the motor before they broke yeah. five chips up on the same motor, but yeah, that's an excellent point. It's, it, it's, it's a historical thing now, and and I suspect it's probably been solved, and I just didn't get to know about how or why. Um, I mean, it's electronics, you know, you, shit happens, you know, and that that's why they have spare chips. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they, I'm, I'm, if I was in such an event and I burned five chips and I couldn't figure out why, I would probably, I would probably be upset and and start pointing fingers. And a lot of times, you're no, I, I don't. I'm not sure that that oh, actually happened. Contestors. I'm aware of any issue like that. It just, it just put them out of the race because they hadn't done another one. Anyway, Phil, did I notice you've got flat curbs on the outside of your uh, Skeletric Sport track there as well? Um, I've got some flat curbs. Now, I do have some of the red and white ones as well. And I've threatened a zillion see them. times to order a 3D printer so I can print some flat aprons. Um, and as a matter of fact, I was looking at even color 3D printers. But true to, I'll tell you what, Greg, I never knew that they were as popular as they evidently are. Yeah. Yeah, when I could buy them, I, I expressly went shopping and went to a few different hobby store, stores over in, in the Detroit area and kept looking for only the flat blast, the flat uh, curbs instead of the, the bump red and white curbs. And they sold, you know, I bought all that I could find and then suddenly you couldn't find them anymore. But I also have a few pieces of, of, uh, of uh, curbing that I've painted with plastic dip, and my intention is to do them all now. So that you can see me sitting here messing with yeah. the Sharpie and this piece of plastic plant, and I'm making trees while I'm sitting here online. So if you wonder what is he doing, uh, that was that would be part of my show and tell if I was doing a show and tell tonight. Okay. That's awesome. Where, where, where did you get the uh, plastic trees? Well. They're not plastic trees, they're plastic bushes. So right now I'm just throwing my Sharpie against my bush here and uh, <laughs> trying to turn the, the stump black. So, you know, I think a black stump is good. Um, I, I'm just glad that you know, you're from this <laughs> green stump versus Again. a green stump. So the whole thing's all green, right? I mean, it just looks like a big, big piece of green glob. So. You know, you see me just kind of doing this, and you know, later I may uh, take some brown paint and dip these in. But uh, all my scenery is—I think I talked about that before. All my scenery is portable. Nothing on my track is is sealed down. Not even the the grass is even uh, the vinyl back woodland scenic grass paper, and then it's just sitting on the track. I haven't even put double tape under a double sticky tape underneath it. All my, all the bushes, after I use my, my uh, spray foam insulation, after it dries, I paint it, and I just stab these in there, and that's it. Now, when you do the spray foam insulation, does, is it, I, I'm tempted to try it, but it can be difficult to control. Oh, it's not hard to control. Um, what, I, what I do is I control it two different ways. Um, one way is, uh, is I, I take it and, uh, I use cardboard and I press down on the cardboard while it's still right after I spray it in place. I press it down with cardboard and that holds it in place and helps to bevel it out and so forth. Um, I, I actually can share my screen right quick and show you uh, very quickly something. So let me uh, let me do that. So well, you're getting that here. screen up. I wanted to kind of talk about the black borders a little bit more because. Oh, sorry. Apparently, the I, you know I'm not part of the history of that, but apparently Alan Smith was at least part of the the, the group who requested that Skelectric make these black borders with the flat curbs, <clears throat> and they did a run for it for the American market, and of course you know they made their ways around the world, and I think he I think there was a, a second run of a variety of borders and, and stuff they. I don't believe any have been manufactured for several years now. So any on the market are going to be, you know, old stock or used or something. The most annoying thing is that they didn't, it, it was basically for the, the home club four lane analog track market. So they did not make R2 inners in the black borders. They did not make R1 outers in the black borders. They never existed. Uh, there, there's a couple other things that they never made the black borders out of. And so therefore no flat curbs for, for those borders. So the only way to have those in flat curb is to, you know, people were shaving down the, 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 the bumped curb of a, of a tan border 
or, you know, pulling up the bump and, and putting, you know, window sealer, you know, foam tape or whatever stuff in there to, to make a flat curb. Uh, and so when I started designing the curb inserts for everything, I, that's when I really understood what was missing because in order to make them, I had to have the originals to find out where exactly where the tabs are because the tabs are never in an appropriate place. They're just kind of randomly wherever they decided the tabs would be. So every single insert has a slightly different location for where the tab into the, into the border. Uh, so I had to get people, <laughs> I, had to, I had to get the stink, stinking tan ones just to, just to measure the locations of the tabs. So if anybody out there, by the way, has a 22 and a half degree R1 outside tan border, I need to know the tab locations of that stinking insert so I can do the freaking 3D printed one. But anyways, I'm just, I'm just bitching. You got that picture ready, Phil? Yeah, yeah, hold on a second okay. here. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to share up. Uh, can you guys see my Google Photos now? Not yet. There we go. There we go. So, you know, you can see my fiance there. She's actually getting ready for bed. And when she Google duos me, I take her picture with no makeup, when her hair is not done, and all that stuff, and send them to her. So, anyhow, here's here's uh, here's some, some spray foam here. And I think you might be able to see a little hand moving around on the display. Yep. Uh, yes. My mouse pointer. So, uh, here's spray foam, and you see that I have, you know, taken various pieces of, of cardboard and pressed it on here. Now, doing this, you have to let it dry, and that means you have to get the cardboard off. So to get the cardboard off of here, the first thing I do is I tear up the cardboard where I can, and then there, it's still harshly attached to all the spray foam, foam everywhere else. I don't leave it in place and paint it. What I do is I take a fillet knife, like for the fishermen use, right? If you're gonna fillet, say, a, a, a relatively large, say a 30 pound, you know. Uh, so, so hold on, Phil, you use like a, like a Rapala knife? That's what you use? Yeah, I use, a, I use, a, uh, I use a, a fillet knife that you use for filleting fish. Yeah, know? oh, we I, I got tons of those. Yeah, so I use that and I cut you know, I cut the, uh, the the cardboard. I shave right underneath it, like I'm filleting the uh, the spray foam. I fillet the spray foam to get the cardboard fillets off of it, and then I I continue to cut until I cut it to shape. And when I'm satisfied with the shape, which my standards are pretty low, um, then um, you know you can see here a finished hill, and uh, you know that finished hill. Is just where um, where what I did was just fillet it, and then I spray it, and then I stick a couple trees in it, and that's all she wrote. That's what I'm doing for scenery. Um, it makes it really easy, and if I find it, I want to change my track. All I have to do is pick the piece of scenery up and move it over. The cars crash into it. I pick up the scenery and I move it over. Here you can see my spray foam. Loctite is what I use. It, it has a better bubble pattern inside the spray foam than um, than does the like the uh, what's the other stuff? Uh, the great the great stuff. Uh, oh yeah, another, great stuff, right? Yeah, another common one, but it makes really big air bubbles. So when you start to carve it up, you got a lot of filler that you need to do, or you have to live with a lot of air bubbles. But you can see I've done that. Here I use saran wrap and I, you know, I'm doing my scenery in place. I'm not even, I'm not even taking it apart. My track is runnable every day. And what I do is I take some, uh, some kitchen uh, cling wrap. I wrap it around things I don't want to have get uh, the foam on. And then, you know, I, I commence the spraying. Here, you've got saran wrap between my box of slot cars here. And I'm using that to brace it up so it doesn't expand and push itself out over the top of the track. So <laughs> that's the kind of maybe, stuff I do, right? Phil, maybe, maybe you spray the foam and then they put a saran wrap down and then put the cardboard on the saran wrap and hey, presto. Yeah, you could, you could do that, but I found that the saran wrap is harder to get off. Oh, um, it sticks too, does it? <laughs> yeah, it sticks and, and 
you know, I really found that there was no benefit to go through yeah. the extra work of wrapping the cardboard in saran wrap because I still needed to shave to get the saran wrap off. And yeah, yeah, uh, you know, you still got to shave the stuff up and, and shape it up. It that does, stuff sticks to everything. Yeah, it, it doesn't make it perfect. But what it does is it does pretty good. Um, that's the wrong way. Now I'll flip back to, if you look at this right here, this little area by this, this red building, I'll go to a, a slide that has that building in it now. So let me just uh, scroll up here for a minute. And uh, I made my daughter chili, she really loves that. So dad did good. And uh, now here we go, I'll scroll up. And somewhere in, oh, here we are right here. Here's a nice photo of that thing that I that I did. Now here, you can see I, I have some air bubbles in here. And uh, I decided to live with those and let them be texture in my hill. Uh, but that's what I've done so far. And then um, if you want to see, oh, let's see here. Let me just back out a little bit so I can scroll and Google Photos is what I'm using here to show you guys. That's actually a restaurant. There's me cutting substrate. This is my show and tell tonight. No big deal. I just bought a load of cars. Um, oh, here. Okay, so those those deals where you see me painting the, the, uh, the trunks, what I did here was I didn't paint the trunks, and so they're, they're green. And they got saddles on them, so they don't look too bad. But the idea here is I'm just doing something different uh, and making it come together. Now, I've done a whole bunch of work. Uh, let me back up here a little. Oh, yeah, keep going. Not too far. All right, so anyway, that was, that was a deal with the scenery and how it all comes together. Right here on the end of this, this curve, you can see I took some spray foam. And I did this last night. Took me about 10 minutes to get this done. It took longer for it to, to dry night before last. And then I painted it today and I'll stick some uh, grass on it. And uh, I just spray on the, the grass and then I'm using Woodland Scenic Sprinkle on grass, dust, whatever you want to call it. Here's another one with those trees. I'm making some trees so they're totally movable. So I can just pick them up on a little platform, move them around. So. Greg, that's the crash zone. Um, I'll put a plug in for Greg. I ordered some of that that uh, fencing, the wall with the fencing, the tall stuff that Greg showed a uh, couple slot car chats ago. And I'm going to put those on this area over here because cars come off of this last corner. They start tumbling. They go right through here and they go right off my table. So I'm going to put Greg's fencing here, Greg. And then I show, put some can you show a wider here. shot. Can you show the wider shot again? Yeah, yeah. I'll back up to that. Just trying to get a feel for how that turn is. Oh, yeah, let me. Oh, right here. Here it is. This is a good one, right? Here's that uh, tree yeah. area. So you come around here, and you're cooking. Uh, the trap, the trap, the direction of travel is this way. Oh. And so when you come around here, and you still can be cooking pretty good. Then you come through here and somewhere in here, people lose control. And then the cars keep right on going and they go right off the end of the- Hey, hey, hey Phil, be before you put those barriers up, I'll donate some figures. If you got some video of taking out some figures in that, that would look so cool. <laughs> yeah, I got figurines, That's but so I'm wrong. not sure. <laughs> so, so so wrong. This, right. Yeah, I did this berm right here. Um, just the other night, and tonight I actually cut a little thin uh, piece of plywood and put it underneath here. And you can see there's a piece here already, but it was ill-formed because it actually came from a different uh, a different style of layout I used to have. So I cut one that's really well formed around here, and then I'll take some spray foam and put it underneath here and build a berm out here around the end of the track, so it's finished off a little bit better like this. But this is just tucked underneath. And, and by one of the things I'll say is when you, when you do the spray foam and you have, this is actually banked up a little bit. So when I do the spray foam and I've got a, a little piece of thin, you know, that eighth inch 
uh, particle board, you know, that's underneath there. And then I put, I actually put saran wrap on the table and then I wrap it around the, the, the board here and, and, then I, and then I spray. And after you do that, it makes a nice way to hold up your bank turns. And at the same time, uh, the foam expands and goes, or probably goes back as far back as the first slot here on the outside lane, but it doesn't bleed in because there's saran wrap there. So then I can just lift the thing off, you're good to go, but it makes it very portable and very nice. Now, if I change you know, the track, I might have to cut this thing off where the, say the radius twos are here on the inside and I might have a three or something. And you know, if I change radius in the middle of a curve, which this does do, uh, then this piece out here won't necessarily be perfectly formed if I change the layout, but I can always just cut it off, paint the tip. And I got this, this scenery that I can move around all over the place pretty easily and it, you know, dirt cheap, it's, it's insulation foam. So that's, that's the stuff that I've been doing. I did uh, tonight, Mary went to a hobby store uh, where she lives in Grand Rapids, it's 62 miles to Ryder's Hobby Shop, one way from my house. So my fiance went by tonight and bought me another sheet of 50 by 100 inch long um, grass paper so I can finish out this area here. This will get painted so it looks like pavement. Uh, and then I'll have enough left in that sheet to do these edges. And I'll just cut pieces along the edge and put them underneath the track. And then when I want to pick it up, I just slide it out and I move on. I cut everything in rectangles and squares so I can pick it up later and reuse it elsewhere. So basically I, I cut everything into rectangles for my paper so if I change the track, I've always got, if I take it and use it like a jigsaw puzzle, I can put everything right back together and end up with 50 by 100 inch sheets. So if I ever decide to actually move the track, then I would be able to put you know, paper down over the entirety of the track and then decorate on top of it. But I've pieced it in because I, I don't want to take it apart. Now, when I get in the mood to change the layout, yeah, I'll take it apart and destroy it and then put it all back together same day. But I really didn't want to do that for the scenery. I just went, you know, it's it's a racetrack. It's not a it's not a piece of sculpture here. It's it's my hobby. So I'm just messing around with it. Anyway, nice that's layout. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at the layout yeah. and wondering which bit of the lap is the crux of it. It's yeah. I'm sorry, say that again. Which bit of the lap is the crucial bit to get right, Phil? You know, when you come around this, this track, the, the two places that are tricky, you think that these bins right here being so subtle and having straights between them, you think that that would be an easy part. There's lots of crashes that end up off the corner. They start here and they go off the track here. The other place where you see lots of crashes are right after these lane changers going in here right in here cars end up sitting and you have to reach over from the other side and you can reach over pretty easily and just pick a car up put it back on the track and fortunately with digital you don't have to worry about which lane so you can put it on the closest lane available yeah, yeah. And then so you get crashes here we get them uh these lane changers i think i'm going to move all these down to the other end of the straight yeah because we get in trouble changing lanes because you're going too fast. You're trying to accelerate and win, and you're trying to change lanes at the same time. Ugly situation. But the bad crash zones, this one right here, this area right here, it, it, those are probably the two most often crash zones. And then down here in this corner on the end, cars crash coming out of here and end up against the fence here. Those are the worst places. Those well, are... in our experience, the, the location of your lane changes is generally conforming with our unwritten rule, which is we put them at the end of a straight so that yep. you can usually coast into them or coast through them. Yeah. You yeah. Usually either you're braking or something. And in yep. the middle of a main straight, that's normally a disaster yeah, this, because the speeds. This, this right here, I wanted to have lane changers. So as you approach the start finish line down here, if you wanted to do that little block thing, you know, cause you were trying to, <sighs> The guy was catching you and his your car is just too slow, you'd be able to block him up 
But really what I'm finding is I do have to shift these all the way down to the other end of the straight or, you know, move them around so they're not all clustered right by each other. But today I just bought a, a right hand pit lane that's going to go out on this little void here and give me at least a single right hand pit lane. And I think I'm going to expand this board just enough to uh, use some, some double lane changers here. So I can come off on a right-hand pit lane, and then the next thing will be a full uh, lane changer straight to allow you to move out. So there'll be two lanes of pit lane, and then I'll merge them back in. And I'll merge them down here somewhere by the, this is a bathroom door here. I put this bathroom in just for the slot car track. And if you look at this wall right here, this, this naked wood and this uh, unfinished edge of drywall, that's because this wall right here used to be right about here. And uh, the track was shifted this way a little bit and it was hard to walk in and out of here. So one day I got disgusted with that, took my circular saw and just put it against the wall and just ran it all the way up to the ceiling. And then I had to go get a, I had to just go get a regular <laughs> crosscut saw and cut through it because I couldn't get a saw close enough to the ceiling to get it done. So. That wall's actually been shortened twice, this one over here. And uh, I had to move, the second time I had to move the electrical outlet because there's a light switch that runs some light cans on this end of the track. And there's another light switch, there's two light switches here and they, they light these different areas uh, on light switches. So it's taking a little bit of work, but it's, it's getting there, it's getting there. It's better than a lot of clubs I've got. It's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the adding the scenery, actually one thing I noticed is when you're racing and you have something sitting on your track, it does give you nice places to kind of look at what you're, it's just like on a one-to-one -one track. You start to learn braking markers. You start to learn places where you can tell whether a car is on pace compared to other cars. You know, it, it really does help a lot especially if you're running alone. That's when it, it really starts to make a difference. But uh, there's still some work to do. I've got some walls to build here to go over the, the bridge tiers need to be, the faces need to be finished up. And I've got some uh, vinyl brick and vinyl stone wall uh, covering to put here. So I'll build uh, foam and then I'll, I'll, for the backing, and then I'll put a vinyl stone uh, overpass there just to, make that look a little nicer. So yeah, a little stuff, a little bit of time, guys. Can't get it all at once. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Yep. All right. I'll give this back. Oh, you don't want to see that. <laughs> Five time cancer survivor. And uh, every now and then someone says, what surgeries did you get? So I took a picture of myself all sliced up. Uh, yeah, uh, sent that out to a couple cancer patients and said, you too can live. So <laughs> We don't need to see sliced up Phil. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, we're coming down to the last 15, 20 minutes here. Does anybody else have anything? I, I still got something else I can bring up. I've got something. Um, okay. Speaking of blowing chips and, and the like, I have about 30 of them. Um, yeah, Whoa. don't even go there. Um, I mean, I could. Blown ones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not uncommon for magnet racing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we won't. We'll just bypass that part. Of it. <laughs> um, do you know any place in the U.S. to get them fixed? Nope. Nope. Just Greg K. and U.K.? Pretty much. Uh, I'm sure Dr. C. would be happy to do some chip repair if you contacted him, but primarily Greg K., I mean, the information is out there. You know, if you if you can order the necessary bits, if you've got a steady solder in hand and a good iron, but I certainly wouldn't attempt it. No, not and happening for me. Well, if there you was, got 30. Interestingly, you got 30 there wasn't a Greg. Ship them out. What was that, Phil? If you got 30 of them that are burnt up, you can ship, you can ship them overseas. You can actually yeah. still. Yeah, you know, at that point, it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, one one or two, not a big, not no. not worth it. But if you've got 30, yeah, yeah. That's that's when it starts to become worth actually shipping it over there. As long as you're patient, you know. If you've got a bunch of chips that right. are just going in the garbage, ship well, you them. can't get oh, chips anymore. Nobody's got chips. Oh yeah, 
That's a good point. Yeah, the, like I, I've got the last three right electric dreams, and that's it. Which chips are you looking for? Um, the, uh, the the new DPR chips from Scale Electric. Oh, okay. The Rev H. I, I ordered the last three from Electric Dreams, and those are the last three they had. Yeah. So I would, uh, you know, be patient. I'm sure Scale Electric want to make more if they aren't already, but, you know, the pandemic situation all over the. Yeah. All kinds yeah, of issues sure. with that. But yeah, I mean, if you've got 30 burnt chips, I would definitely, you know, send Greg a PM and say, hey, <laughs> I'm sure he'd be happy to do, do another do some repairs for you most of them are probably for him he's done so he's done thousands of them so i'm sure unless yeah. you have some that are really really bad there he just takes them you know no problem uh there well, interestingly there used to be another greg in the states who did chip upgrades and repairs several mm -hmm. weeks ago he also did um firmware you know, put the custom the uh, incar pro firmware on him but he mm -hmm. hasn't been online for years so I don't know. I, I assume he's not. It was like Greg uh, R or something like that, but I forgot. Mm -hmm. so he hasn't been online for ages. So yeah, pretty much right now, brand new chips or, or Greg K. I, the 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 slotted uh, Type C chip you can put Skelectric firmware on, but you know, I, I I wouldn't pay for a slotted oxygen chip unless I was planning to run oxygen with them. Yeah. In your case, since you've got the ARC system, you've basically got half of what you need to do oxygen anyway. So you can get some Type C chips and put them in your special cars, you know, and, and drive them as electric digital with the firmware. Well, I have I have some slotted chips that I've had, but I've had a lot of trouble with them uh, not being able to count laps. They'll change the lanes, but not count laps, and it makes no sense. Which which but, ones are they? The B or the the A? You know, I don't. I don't know what the are they, difference is. Are they big and square or are they rectangular and they fit in a pod? Rectangular. So yeah, so those are the those the the original Skelectric digital slotted chips, SP12, were mm -hmm. were big, big ginormous things. Oh, not that big, no. Okay. And then and then the SP15, SP15B are their more recent Skelectric digital chips that are, are more reasonable sized fit. Uh, those are going to be, and, and you're, yeah, those have onboard LEDs, right? So you're, you're basically using yeah. LED on the chip. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's going to be how, how, how flat against the chassis you can get it. Uh, yeah. The, the lap counting is this, a lot more. This is the chip. Yeah. That's the, that's the most recent SP15B. Yeah. No, yeah. no ears. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so you know, try to get it flatter on the chassis. There, there are uh, LED soldering points on there, so you can do an offboard LED. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, you can use something more like the Skelectric bulb type LED and have it poke through the chassis and everything like Skelectric do. Mm. The, the the main issue is that the lap counting requires, I think it's five clean uh, ID signals in a row. For it to be counted as a lap so usually when you're passing over the lap lap counter straight fast you're it's going to get a partial and then it's going to get five in a row and if you're lucky it'll get all five before your car is done passing over the sensor uh which is the case in most of the, in most of the time but the problem is the the further away the led is from the track the less mm -hmm. of a window there is as it passes over the sensor and yeah so have you tried making a bigger hole for it to shine through not yet. I, I'll do that on a couple and see what happens. Yeah, that's the first thing you do is make a nice big hole for that LED. So because it's got an angle to it, so if you uh, have, if you have a small hole and the LED is you know the hole is going to create okay. a shadow, right? So if yeah. you make a big hole, then the LED is going to cast more light, and you're going to get more signal through to the. Center. I didn't realize it was angular like that. Yeah, and, and that's because because it's passing over that so quickly, it's got a, sure. you know, here's the sensor here, you're, gonna, you're making a wide beam. Right, you make it a out. beam, yeah, I get that. Right. So making the hole in the track bigger would, would also help, right? Except the, the LEDs, the sensor is already pretty much right at the bottom of the slot, so making a bigger hole there isn't going to give more light to the LED. Well... 
I've tried. It, it, the, the, yeah, LED, the, the sensor is literally using a, there's, a no, there's nothing casting there's nothing casting shadow on the sensor. The only thing uh, casting light okay. shadow is the chassis, how big your hole is in the chassis. That's why Scale X LEDs are poking right through the chassis. There's nothing to right. make. Right. Right. So if you're if you're using those chips with this with the LED on board and the and the chip mm -hmm. is sitting above the chassis, then you don't want to make a bigger hole so that the light can shine through and have less of a less of a I'll give that a try and see it works. It helps. Um, and getting it closer to the chassis, getting the chassis closer, making the hole bigger, making the car go slower, right? If the, if you put it, if you if you have your lap counter in the middle of your longest straight, which is what most people do, the car is going top speed, right? So if you put your lap counter in a short straight where your car is not going quite so fast, you'll get more. Oh, uh, it makes sense. So all of those okay. things combined, if you're going super fast with your magnet cars, your cars are going just lightning fast and the, the chip's too high and the hole's too small, yeah. Because all the lane changer needs is basically a flipped signal. It, it, a, a, a normal ID signal, no change. A flipped ID mm -hmm. signal, change. And it doesn't care how many how many it counts to verify. It just sees one and says, oh, that car wants to change lane. So that's why lane changers work in lap counters don't. Okay. Good, good to know. Good information. Great. Yeah, yeah. very good. Great. <laughs> Sometimes, right? Oh, that's excellent. Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn every once in a while. <laughs> Somebody was asking about Scorpius controllers as alternatives for uh, me. Yeah, extra. No, you you asked before. I had oh, another yeah. guy ask me right before I hopped on the chat, and I'm said I said oh, I see. Zoom chat, hop on, you know. But apparently he doesn't he doesn't zoom. We'll get him hooked up. But I don't have enough time to really dig into Scorpius controllers, other than he said. Two thousand dollars? That's crazy. And I'm like, you know, even if you bought six Scorpius controllers at 140 bucks a pop, that's not two thousand dollars. Yeah. What you need on top of that is the dongle and a compatible power base, right? So assuming he's already got the APB and a computer that runs it, all he needs are six controllers. So what? That's seven, eight hundred bucks, and then the dongle. So maybe a thousand dollars for for all six. Yeah. I actually was going to bring up about the true speeds. I can't find them anywhere. Nobody's got them in stock. That's because he's, they pretty much sell out as soon as he's got any in stock. And so you got to wait until he starts building them again. So hopefully that's sometime soon. Yeah. Um, yeah I might get it Steve directly, directly on that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, did you, you haven't had a chance to speak with him since we talked about this last time, have you, Wayne? <laughs> you got to wait until you're no. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. So. Patience. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> yeah, and I think you guys that want digital controllers can get the back of the line because we've been waiting. Us non-digital guys have been waiting for like two years for his late for his new top of the range Alpha. controller. He's got a thing called an Apex that's coming, and it's been coming and it's been coming and it's been coming, and we haven't seen it yet. And, uh, Did you see I have. It? Did you? <laughs> you you well, seen the Apex? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen two of them in uh, testing uh, at my slot club at the North Wales Club. Yeah, well, cool. Wayne's got Wayne's got Steve as a best buddy. Yeah, that's it. Wayne. No, he's not. No, he's just a, he's just an acquaintance that I, I I bump into from time to time. But I have seen, and the the, the guy at the club who I can't beat, he's using one. Uh, Speaking of all this, because I'm pretty sure it's tangentially related. Uh, David, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Kale is how I pronounce it. The guy who who owns, um, BLST. BLST. What's what's his Silage racing, yeah. He he recently showed off a controller that he's working on. He says it's his own design, but it's using a true speed shell, and it has an OLED display, graphical you know bit you know dot display on the controller with knobs and things, and and it looks pretty. And it's analog only. It looks pretty sweet. I don't know. Is that anything similar to what the Apex is supposed to be look like? What is I don't it? know. Seen the Apex yet? But, uh, I think the uh, the Apex is just a new, better version of the existing the PWM. five knob PWM two. Yeah, is it PWM two? Uh, yeah, PWM two. Yeah. So, yeah, have, so have David's there. working on a, a pretty fancy looking analog controller. Maybe he'll maybe his will be out before <laughs> before, before Steve. Steve yeah. <laughs> oh well, we'll just wait and see. But Steve makes great stuff. I mean, the, the yeah. quality of his work is great, and the support that he gives. Uh, to give his customers is excellent. 
Oh, absolutely. What, what I like to think it's because of all those years that he lived in South Africa, but maybe not. <laughs> As an example of his fantastic customer support, and I've mentioned before that you know my my digital club did group buys of controllers to get a better you know price because of shipping and all that jazz with him. But he developed he, he you know he constantly is improving his controllers and stuff and and the first set of uh, regular wired true speed controllers we got for our digital racing was an earlier not the earliest but it was an early electric digital true speed. He updated the the wiper so it was a different mm -hmm. material a better material yeah, and different new ones of stainless off. steel. Yeah, and and I've said you know gee that'd be nice and he he basically sent me the new wipers and showed me how to install them. And it was just, you know, once, you know, desolder, resolder a wire and screw on the new wiper and bada boom, bada bing. I got the new, <laughs> I got the new better wiper on my controller. So, you know, yeah, he's, a, he's an awesome dude. Hopefully he gets back to manufacturing soon and, and Mike and other people will get the controllers they want to. Yeah. Mike, well, you said you couldn't find any two speeds. What are you looking for? Probably the, the digital, digital plugins. Yeah. SSD three, I think, were the were the version number. Yeah. Did you look did you look at Electric Dreams? Yeah, it says that they're a pre order only. Uh okay, because I remember actually all right. I remember actually looking at those the other day and um, I pulled out the box that's full of those and there must be fifteen or twenty of them there. And, and well, I'll look tonight. tonight. Well, I'm looking at the website right now, and it still says pre-order. I'll check with them tomorrow when I'm there. Okay. And, it's uh, also and worth it's noting if you have any SSD4, if you have any of the wireless ones, for whatever reason, they are also capable of being wired controllers. So you can plug a, a patch cable into the controller well, and then into your wireless controller. would be preferable for me, but but then you got to get the the the, the uh, SCS receiver. <laughs> <laughs> for the yeah, it's true. Yeah. What are you showing there, uh, Wayne? Is that the club that uh, Steve is at? Th this, this is Steve. That right there in the white shirt. Blue yeah, white. that's Steve oh, and his yeah, tag, and that, 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 that's me in the same jumper I'm wearing today. And there we are at the uh, the North Wales Slot Car Club doing a race side by side. And because we've got six drivers behind a podium that's made for four, you can see these white blocks are the, the sockets for the controllers to plug in. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, wireless in use all all controllers were provided by steve for that day but the ones that were near enough we used wired because it was just reliable but these two are on wireless are you racing so, SSD yeah. there? we're racing skeletrics but digital oh, with the magic r cap the magic r cap is on the on the monitor mm. we're using the c7042 apb you can see the um, light gantry thing there so this is a this is a plastic track laid on top of a wooden track. So uh, how are you using the Magic Arc app on the C7042 power base? I don't know the answer. Technically, I didn't make it happen. Okay, so that looks like SSDC, not Magic. Ah, uh, okay. I might be wrong. <laughs> I'm not familiar with SSDC, but that looks. Okay, I've only used this, done this one race. This race was very early in 2018, I think. And this was my first go at digital scale electric racing. It wasn't, I've done oxygen before that, but this was my first go at scale electric digital. Yeah, if that's and a, uh, if, I was just a customer that day, so to speak. If it's an APB, I mean, for it to be true speed controllers, right? Is true speed controllers? Yes, all pretty of much, true pretty speech. Much has to be the cease. It has to be not an arc base, and the magic only works with arc base. And that yes, that's right. It was seventy forty two base. Yeah, and that screen looks a lot like the 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 leaderboard of the SSDC SSD console, which was which it might be still a great app. Oh yeah, that's SSDC for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, they yeah. just, just found me scroll wheel. So okay, the, it was organized. It was put on, and all the track was provided by a commercial. Scale electric event provider called Think Scale Electric in the UK. Yep. Um, you may have come across them. They actually manufactured a permanent layout that went in the Williams Formula One yep. um, factory. I think that's recently gone back up for sale. Yeah, they've. Now that Williams has changed hands. But that was just a single event that this was the first time I ever went to that club. 
and the wood track was there underneath it. And I was like, oh, wow, look, I want to go on that underneath it. <laughs> and so I've been back there about a dozen times now. Nice. Um, and that's what I, that, I was just showing you that Steve attends and Steve stood next to me there. We believe we did, <laughs> we did. We did. We, if you've never met him, yeah, or never seen him, he's that. That's him. <laughs> Looks like a top bloke. <laughs> a top bloke. Yeah. All right, we're at our two hour, two hour mark as normal. I will hit the stop button. We will continue chatting and say bye.